Hi guys, um, it's Lian. I decided uh, to do another video, just a short one, on history taking and the structure that I use when I, I am doing my history on a patient and how I gather my information. And I've used this uh, structure to help me, um, of, of course, in my career and also to go through some of the uh, history taking stations that I've been tested in. Um, in all these clinical exams. Okay, uh, I won't waste too much time, so let's get into it. Um, once you introduce yourself, um, hello, my name is Dr. Washira. You know, you show your identification. You go in, you greet the patient. Um, you can give them a handshake or you can, it's usually good, I think, just to give them a handshake in the beginning. Some have not given the patient a handshake in the beginning, which is also fine. But by all means, if the patient initiates the handshake, you know, you can always tell when somebody wants to greet you, they lean forward. When, if, if at all you see this cue, please go ahead and greet them. And then look at the chair and say, may I have a seat? Okay. Uh, then take a seat and, and say, okay, um, how may I help you today? Or even before they say, what is your name, please? Some people have been um, messing up in the introduction, which is uh, what I call a false start. So they want to start well, but then they fumble. Either they fumble and give two names or, uh, you know, my name is Dr. Lian Washira. So just give one name and keep it simple. Um, or they say, how may I call you? What may I address you as? Uh, um, just introduce yourself and say, what can I call you? Oh, what is your name, please? That's, this is when much more friendlier. What is your name, please? And then they say, my name is John Smith. Now, here's the catch. If they say two names, you ask, what may I call you? But if they give you the name John, you call them John and you move on. You don't say Mr. John, Sir John. You just pick the name because they're giving you the name that they want to use. And it gets awkward when you say, um, okay, Mr. John, and then they say, no, no, call me John, John is fine. Um, and if you don't clarify which name to use, if they say John Smith, you don't want to keep calling them, okay, uh, John Smith, what has been happening to you? John Smith, what are your symptoms? You don't want to say Mr. Smith because they did not tell you to, to use Mr. Smith. So ask them. If the patient tells you two names, ask them, what may I call you? If they give you one name, use the name that they've given you and continue. So, hello, my name is Dr. Washira. Um, what's your name, please? My name is John. Nice to meet you, John. Can I sit down? Or you can say, thank you for coming, John. Thank you for keeping this appointment. And then may I sit down? Then sit. Don't just plop into the chair. Just ask, ask, you know, for, for permission to sit down. And then sit down. What brings you in today? And lean in as you ask the question. What brings you in today? Um, doctor, I've been having uh, headaches. Sorry to hear that. Please tell me more. Don't just say sorry and then, you know, have an awkward silence. You, you always want to make sure your words initiate a patient response. So sorry. Please tell me more. Oh, sorry to hear that. Please tell me more. Okay, my headache started uh, yesterday and uh, now it's um, it started on one side and now it's going all over my head. Okay, any other symptoms? Um, okay, my, the headache, um, with, with my headache, I have a fever or with my headache, I'm having problems with my vision. Um, with my headache, I'm having uh, vomiting. Then go back to the headache and ask your Odipara questions or ask your Socrate questions. So um, I use my own system. I, I, I call it old cart. So O-L-D-C-A-A-A-R-T. And why I made my own system of um, investigating pain is so that I don't miss anything. O for onset L for location, D for duration, A, um, any, um, any alleviating sim symptoms, aggravating symptoms, 
um, R, radiation to any part of the body, um, T, any treatment. So this is how I, I usually um, expound on, um, on pain. Okay, um, so doctor, I have pain. Um, okay, when did it start? Uh, is it uh, moving to any other part of your body? So don't say, is it moving anywhere? Is it radiating? You have to really explain um, what you, you want to say to the patients because they don't understand the medical language. Is it moving to any part of your body like your jaw? Is it moving to any part of your body like your neck so that your sentences are full? Okay, so if he, he expounds on this, as uh, show concern, you know, I'm sorry to hear that. That must be frustrating for you. Has it affected your job? You know, or uh, I'm, I'm sorry, this sounds like it has caused, um, um, it has caused you a lot, a lot of suffering. How are you coping with this? So before you, uh, you start your differentials, you have to show concern of the presenting symptom that they have given to you. So instead of moving too fast, okay, sorry that uh, you have been feeling like this. Has this affected your work? Ah, yes, doctor. It's really, I, I, I really am having a hard time concentrating at work. Show compassion. Okay, what do you do for work? I am an accountant. This, now I see how difficult this must be for you. Do you like your job? Yes, doctor. It's a, uh, it's a bit stressful, you know, but I manage. Okay, that's good. Um, now, when you're getting into your differentials, at the door you have uh, pick three differentials that, that you may want to use um, or, or, or that are related to the case. But try and, and in the next couple of days before your exam, and by all means, if you have time, really try and make a flow in the differentials. So if somebody comes for a headache, I ask them, okay, you have a headache, all right, is it moving anywhere to your eyes? Any problem with the eyes, any spots? Uh, do you see any floating images? Um, is it one eye affected? Is it both eyes affected? Do you have any pressure in the eyes? Is there any tearing in the eyes? Um, do the eyes hurt? So now my differentials are all in, in, in the system of, of, of the eyes. Okay, and then to move from differential to differential, I pick a symptom that is similar to in, in, in different differentials. So now from, um, from headache, if I want to start asking symptoms of meningitis, then I'll pick fever. Have you been having any fever? No, doctor. Have you been having any neck pain? You see, we're still in the head. Uh, so I'm not moving from uh, the headache to back pain to leg pain. So I'm, I'm keeping all the symptoms within this area because this is the, the chief complaint was the head. So um, my differentials are all within this area. Okay, so headache, you've moved to the eyes, any fever, any neck pain, any vomiting. Now, because vomiting is with uh, the throat, then I go into any sore throat, any, because then now I'm trying to see if there have been any infections with the patient. Okay, sore throat, coughing. So now I'm going to respiratory. Do you have any coughing? Any shortness of breath? Now I'm in the chest. Shortness of breath, any um, or any problems breathing, any coughing. Now I'm in the chest area, any chest pain. So your differentials should flow and find similar symptoms that connect the differentials. Okay, if it, if it's um, ear pain after you go into the throat, then branch into the ear. Any uh, discomfort in the ear, any discharge in the ear, uh, any fullness of the ear, but Try and keep your differentials together. So now where are we? We are um, chest pain. Um, does it go anywhere? Uh, is there any heaviness while you're breathing? Okay, no doctor. At this point, you have to stop and ask them, what is your main concern? So you want to make sure whenever you're doing your history, you're not the one talking too much. You're not the one um, in, a, in, in 30 seconds or in a minute, the patient should have talked two or three times. So you have to um, 
you have to pull them into talking by, by, by saying, do you have questions at this time? Do you have any concerns right now? I'm asking you these questions because I want to get a better picture of what is going on. May I continue? All right. So after the chest, then I go into the stomach. Do you have any uh, stomach pain? This is where I target um, bowels and bladder. Like I said in the first, um, uh, in the first introductory video, try and stick to terms that are known by most people. So no loose motions. Um, use diarrhea, constipation, or hard stools, watery stools. Um, any straining when you're having your bowel movements? Do you, are you noticing any blood or any mucus in the bowel movements? Do you have any pain in your stomach? Okay. Um, do you have any pain in your back? So now I'm already in the kidneys. Do you have any urination, uh, burning while urination? Do you have, have you noticed any foul smell uh, while urinating? Um, and then before I, I go into uh, joints, because now I'm moving from head to toe, I ask about the skin because most bowel problems you can see with the skin. And also there's a link to to differentials with appetite and appetite links with cancer. So I'm, I'm trying to, pay, to paint a picture for you how to link your differentials together. So how I'll target the cancer diagnosis is after I ask any bowel problems, is there any problems with eating, uh, any uh, problems with swallowing, uh, any loss of weight, any tiredness, or fatigue, um, and then I, I go into the skin. Have you noticed, most people say, have you noticed any lumps or bumps? That's very generic. Have you had any lumps or bumps? Be a little specific. Have you noticed any abnormal swellings or rash on the body of unusual appearance or any raised lesions on the body or different, uh, different skin tones? No, doctor. Okay. Um, so pretty much we have gone through 10 differentials, but all of them have linked with a common symptom. Uh, this is a good structure of how you can get your history. That way you stop saying things like, I have a few more questions to ask you. Can I ask you a few more questions? You don't want to show the patient that you're moving from system to system you want it to move smoothly so once you've really expounded on um the the, the complaint and with every complaint I, I usually ask him how is this affecting you how are you coping with it how are you managing with it if it's depression how are you managing with it are you taking any medications have you taken a vacation recently are you relaxing all these things are the ones that increase your interpersonal skills with a patient they build a lot of rapport and, and it doesn't sound fake okay all right once you're done with your um chief complaint i if i do not know what is going on by this time at least you should have from your differentials you should have the diagnosis if you don't then go through a review of systems from head to toe and ask them is there anything um that may be bothering you from head to toe that anything I may have missed um, in my questioning. And I, I apologize if I asked many questions before, I just want to get a better picture. So you're taking care of the patient and you're taking care of the disease. How I go into past medical history, I never say, now I will ask you questions about your medical history. Never do that. Never. Uh, Never say, um, never alert the patient that you never show them you are structured. It's much better to just flow. Um, how I go into maftosa is after I've done my 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 differentials. Oh, and another thing with differentials, you always you always want to make sure you have differentials for three things. I made sure that I would rule out at least cancer, and I would rule out infections, uh, stroke. Uh, and heart conditions. At least ask a few questions on these four systems for completeness because you don't want to miss um, these diagnoses in, in any patient interaction. Okay, 
am I going too fast? Uh, let me know, I can slow down. Uh, so going into your past medical history, once you're done with your question asking, you can ask them any main concerns at this time? Uh, no doctor. Have you had any hospitalizations? So I don't just ask, do you have any medical conditions? I usually start with like an overview. Have you had any recent uh, hospitalizations? Any surgeries in the past? Um, uh, have you had any, any injuries or any traumatic uh, experience recently or in the past? No doctor. Uh, I, do you have any medical conditions like diabetes, hypertension? or kidney disease or heart disease. Or you can just say, you know, do you have uh, any medical conditions like high blood pressure or heart disease? No, doctor. Do you have any allergies? Now you can say, instead of just getting yes, no, yes, no, you want to have a conversation. So with allergies, I never ask, do you have any allergies, full stop. I would say, do you have any allergies, any specific allergies to any foods? Do you have any seasonal allergies? Are you affected by the pollen or dust, okay, or any pet dander? Because it shows you're speaking to the patient, but you're also speaking to the other observers who may be in the room who are grading your performance. You don't want to just be one dimensional. So it's explore these, uh, explore allergies. You never know, a diagnosis may be hidden in, 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 in allergies. Even, um, this is where I can even ask, you know, any sensitivity to, hot, really extremely hot or cold temperatures? No. All right. How is your family doing? Does anyone in your family complain of the same symptoms that you have? Instead of saying, does anybody in your family have the same uh, problem? Uh, how about your father or how about your mother? You don't want to be surprised by the patient who says, my father died. So you assumed, you assumed they have a father and you assumed they have a mother. You want to say, how is your family doing? Does anybody else have the, has anybody else complained of the same symptoms? So if it's food poisoning, you'll catch, you'll catch a gastroenteritis that has been caused by maybe a, a, a restaurant that they went to and they ate bad food. Um, but the family is where I feel most of the interpersonal uh, skills are hiding because if anyone in the family is suffering with anything, you have to comment. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. May I ask what is what is what their um, what their condition is instead of asking what do they have? It's none of your business. You may get a person who will tell you, you know, it's I don't want to share it. But it's always better just to say, may I ask what they have? Are they managing it well? Are they followed by a doctor? Okay, how is this affecting you as their brother? Oh, doctor. Uh, I, oh, doctor, he's my twin brother and I feel so sad. I really hope he feels better. Then you say, you know, I can see you're a very concerned brother. Okay. That's how I do family. It's extensive. If the, they say, oh, um, um, if ask, do you have any, uh, anyone in the family who is suffering with the same condition? Oh, my father, he died of a heart attack. I'm really sorry to hear this. When did he die? Oh, he died a couple of years ago. How are you coping with it? Uh, I'm coping. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coping. Okay, doctor. All right. How about your mother? She too died of uh, a stroke. I'm really sorry that you have lost two parents. So um, please, when it comes to family history, don't just ask any conditions in the family. No. Any allergies? No. Any medical conditions like diabetes and, and hypertension? No. Any surgeries? No, it's not a communication. It's not. It doesn't show that you um, that you're concerned, and this is what you want to show the patient. They, as it is, they are anxious that they've come to a hospital. You should be the one to relieve the anxiety and not cause more. Okay, so you've done your medication, your allergy, your um, family history, social history. So after you ask about the family, how I segue into smoking alcohol, I never just ask any smoking. I usually put it like this. By the way, do you smoke? Any chance that you smoke? Yes, doctor. How much do you smoke? And usually at this time, I'm, I'm trying, you have to make sure that your face does 
not change so that you don't show that you are judgmental of the person who is smoking. Yes, doctor, I smoke. How much do you smoke? I smoke 10 packets a day. For how long? For the past 20 years. Have you tried quitting? Yes, that is really good that you have tried. Have you been successful? No. What challenges have you faced while you're trying to smoke? Uh, doctor, I really feel like I'm really addicted to it. Now, the thing is, if this is an examination station, you can't start counseling on smoking history. If it's a social station, then you can start the counseling. But for smoking, you have to investigate a little bit. If I was doing an examination smoke, um, station and a patient said that they were smoking, I would say, uh, okay, how much do you smoke? I uh, smoked uh, two packs a day for the last 10 years. Uh, have, you, have you tried to quit? Uh, no, doctor. Uh, are you interested in quitting? No, doctor. Okay. Whenever you, uh, if you ever consider uh, quitting, please let us know. We have some support services to help you. End of story for an examination station because you don't have time to really uh, be concerned about the smoking. You'll never finish your exam. Okay, so that's how I start my smoking uh, questions. Any chance you smoke? By the way, do you smoke? Okay, how about any alcohol? Yes, doctor, I take one pint of uh, beer a day. Okay, um, don't counsel anybody to quit drinking if it is not appropriate. I think it's 13 to 14 pints a week for men and maybe even the same for women. Just make sure you know not to counsel anybody to stop taking alcohol. And if they say, I do not drink alcohol, don't say that is good. Leave it. Leave it. Because the, ex the examiner might be uh, someone who drinks alcohol. And you don't want to, to offend anybody in the room who, who, um, who takes alcohol. Okay. So if they say, no, I don't drink uh, alcohol, say, okay. Okay. At this point, if you did not ask about the occupation of the patient, this is when you ask it. You ask smoking, alcohol, li um, uh, living, and travel. So I have the acronym SALT. Smoking, alcohol, living, travel. Do you smoke? No. Do you take alcohol? No. What do you do for a living? Because it's all lifestyle. It's all the social aspect of the patient. So this is where, if I forget to ask what they do in the beginning, I remember at this point. What do you do for a living? Do you like your job? Do you think your job may be, be adding uh, to the effects of what you're suffering from? Do you think your job might be causing you more stress or maybe causing you uh, uh, um, more anxiety? Do you think it, uh, when, when was the last time you took a vacation? Do you think that maybe it might be a good time for you to take a bit of rest until um, you recover from your condition? Yes, doctor, I think so. Maybe that's all these are little, it's showing concern. I'm not saying that you're going to offer a sick note for everything. You're just offering concern and you're making the patient look to see that, oh, my disease can also be caused by my environment, you know. Um, if somebody smokes also or doesn't smoke, you can always say, you know, do you have anybody in the house who smokes? Uh, that way you're, you're showing that you are looking at uh, considering that secondary smoke is also harmful and can influence um, the health of your patient. Okay, so what do you do for a living? Do you travel for work? Of course, if somebody tells you that um, a housewife or I do, okay, well, yeah, housewives, they travel for work. Or if they, um, if they uh, maybe they do some housekeeping or maybe they do some gardening, you can ask, do you travel for work? You know, and, and this way you can catch patients who, you, you can catch the, the TB diagnosis that may be hiding um, in, in travel history. Um, or hepatitis that may be, may be hidden in this travel history. Okay, uh, so this is your past medical history. You've done, uh, you've done the history of presenting illness. And this is the structure that I have for every single case that I do in examinations and in practice. What is the history of presenting illness? I have pain. Uh, sorry, what is the chief complaint? I have pain. What is the history of presenting illness? 
all the symptoms, your odipara, your socrates, and my old cart. And then after that, I do a review of systems. If I do not know uh, what the diagnosis may be, or if I do not have any idea, and then I give the past medical history. And the past medical history is any hospitalizations, medical conditions, allergies, uh, social uh, family history, social history, which is salt, smoking, alcohol, living, what do you do for a living, and travel. And at this time, I also have a mental stop. Is this patient old? I need to find out if they are safe in the home. I need to check if there's any abuse, if there's any depression, if there's any um, dementia, if there's any 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 age-related uh, changes that may present as disease, if they are old. If they are pediatrics, then I go into a pediatric history, their birth history, immunizations, the red book, and their developmental chart, chart and their uh, social history. If they're a pregnant woman, I want to know um, how many children do they have? Is this their first pregnancy? If they've had any miscarriages, any antenatal visits, any special medications that they may be on? Is the baby kicking uh, what they've used for oral contraceptive, I mean, for contraceptive use? And then if they're middle age, middle age for me is anybody between 18, and um, let me not say the end because I might get into trouble here. <laughs> so middle age, 18 plus, young patient, I want to find out sexual history. Uh, I want to find out sexual history from anybody who's asking for, of course, uh, oral contraceptives, any suspicion of HIV cases. I want to find sexual history from um, anybody who is who has traveled and is coming in with symptoms of acute HIV. So this is how I, I, I do it. I'll say it again. History, a uh, chief complaint, this is the framework. His, um, chief complaint, history of presenting illness, review of symptoms, uh, past medical history, which starts with, do you have any, have, have you had any hospitalizations, surgeries, I go into medical conditions, allergies, um then family history then social history stop what type of patient am i dealing with old person i'm looking for abuse young person i'm also looking for abuse and i'm looking for um their birth history uh and for young uh, young people or pediatrics there's the acronym birds b i r d s birth history immunization the red book development and so their social history how are they doing in school are they a, is is he a good boy all these things and i use this in in my breaking bad uh breaking of bad news stations i went into a bit of um uh the pediatric history and it helps also to show that you care for the patient middle age person um sexual history definitely i also ask them about recreational drugs they are 18 plus until uh, an, a certain age, until maybe 50, 50. Because if you're sitting in front of a, a little old lady who's looking so cute, the last thing you want to do is ruin all your rapport by asking them if they do drugs. Do you shoot up some heroin, granny? <laughs> you don't, please don't ruin your rapport because you... You need to find out information. If there's if there, there's nothing in the differentials to to warrant a sexual history or warrant the question about recreational drugs, please do not ask this to elderly um, elderly um, patients. Okay. All right. So yeah, then the pregnant woman also, please you have to do a good extensive is any antenatal care when you found out about uh, your pregnancy did you start your prenatal vitamins what type of symptoms have you been having have you been having nausea any vomiting um have you been gaining weight appropriately what has been your diet um 
any sporting have you uh, how many uh, children do you have how are they doing oh, they're good um just a little rapport especially with pregnant the, pre the pregnant woman population is very sensitive um you ask about uh, i think miscarriages i also said um sorry my my camera just went off um but this is how i do it and in every single case this is how i approach the station so i'll never be faced and and then if i forget where i am i ask the question am i going too fast um would you want me to slow down or do you want me to clarify anything or uh, do you have any questions at this time and then i remember okay i've asked all the questions i am at social history um i finished that she's a pregnant woman does she feel safe at home if this is a child does does he feel safe at home is he taken care of by a babysitter how many people are in the home um and the whole the, the whole picture around pediatrics if it's a young person then i'm asking about um i'm asking about uh, sexual history recreational drugs if anybody's coming to ask for um if anybody has complaints of uh like specific complaints like in obs and gynae or in breast exam i ask them stuff like okay so please explain to me how you do your breast exam and i and i did it for one of my patients that i saw i said can you please uh tell me step by step how you do your breast exam and she said how you know how i do it and i say okay it's good you know to use the palm the soft part of your fingers and also when you're doing your breast exam feel underneath your armpits to check for swellings or tenderness and also feel around your neck to check if you have any um, any swellings in this area. You have a couple of lymph nodes that drain the breast and they are usually in these areas. Okay, so you've educated your patient. Your patient will live being, uh, once you're done with your patient, this patient will feel cared for, concerned for, and they will live a little bit more educated than they first saw you. Okay. Once I'm done with my my um, my history taking, now this is the main part. I how I move into the physical exam is I say um, I would like to check your vital signs, which include your heart rate, your blood pressure, your temperature, your oxygen level, and use. Now I've started adding um, a, a fasting blood glucose because some diagnosis of hy hypo and hyperglycemia are hidden in the fasting blood sugar but if you don't ask for it you will not get the results and you will fail um you'll fail in the management of your of your patient at the nhs hospital or at the nhs clinic okay so i never i never say okay now i'm going to do the examination uh, no uh, i usually just how I said you are now into the, the physical exam I said, okay, it would be good for me to check your heart rate, your blood pressure, your, um, your uh, oxygen levels, um, and your temperature. It will also be good for me to check your uh, blood glucose at this time. Of course, it has to be appropriate to the case. By all means, if the patient presents and they are drowsy, and uh, it seems like it's an emergency case, ask for your, the vital signs you, and tell them, you know what, I'm going to stop asking you questions now and I need to check your heart rate, your blood pressure, uh, your oxygen level, your temperature, and I also want to check your blood sugar. For all emergency cases, I say this in the first 20 seconds of the interview because you don't want to wait until all the, the until the end in order to give this management but i tell the patient you know it seems like you are not stable now i would like to stop asking you questions i will ask them to you after i stabilize you but right now i want to check your vital signs which is blah 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 blah, blah and also a blood sugar okay um and then you say um uh, after okay uh, um heart rate blood pressure uh, oxygen level, temperature, and I'd like to examine your hand, and I'd like to examine your leg, and I'd like to examine 
your eyes. If it's an examination station, I just flow. I don't even, I don't even pause because you don't have too much time to, to wait and look for the response and all this. I'd like to examine your hands or your legs or your spine or your uh, abdomen or your chest. I'd like to examine your neck. What this involves is, so I, this is the acronym I use for examination. P E C C U. P E C C U. P -E -C -C -U. Procedure. I am going to explain the procedure first. E, exposure. C, con um, consent. Then the other C is a chaperone if it is needed and you. Um, please let me know if you have any pain or uncomfort, if, you're, if, you're uh, if, if this is going to be uncomfortable for you at any point during uh, the examination, please let me know and I will stop the exam. So this is how I go, I go in, into my examination. I would like to examine your leg. It involves me uh, bending the leg and tapping it with one of my instruments. I would like you to expose uh, from your mid thigh all the way down. Is this okay with you? Or does this sound okay? That's the, the consent. Okay. And then does this warrant a chaperone? Does a knee examination warrant a chaperone? No. Does a thyroid examination warrant a chaperone? No. Only from the neck down to the waist up. That's where you need a chaperone. Of course, in the pelvic, the pelvic and perineal area. Don't say you want to have a chaperone for a hand exam. Don't say you want a chaperone for the back, uh, for a, a, a shoulder exam or eye exam. It's some, some, some people are so scripted, they're saying they want a chaperone to do an ear exam. And I'll give you a chaperone for, your ear, uh, for this exam. It's not needed. And, so, and it shows that you're not present. You know? So this is the P-E-C-C-U. Uh, this is what I'm going to do the procedure, the exposure, and now is the time to know how to explain an exposure fluently. So you're not saying, uh, I want you to expose from your waist uh, up, uh, no, sorry, from your waist down, actually no, from mid thigh to mid, no. For each and every system, this is things that you should have now started polishing. If it's a, 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 a stomach exam, I want you to, uh, Expose from the waist up all the way to the middle, right below the breastbone. That's the area I would like to see. If it's a breast exam, I'd like you to expose the area from your neck all the way down to the mid stomach or for the legs. So have it, have it smooth so you're not fumbling. Every time you fumble, it kind of takes away the confidence points. But now, please, just try and uh, for every system, know what you're going to say for procedure. I never say I'm going to, um, I'm going to inspect, I'm going to palpate, I'm going to percuss, and then I'm going to, I even forget what the other P is. Inspect, palpate, and auscultate. I never say that because it's going to take time and they're going to see me doing it. So this is the procedure I'm going to do. This is... I'm going to use a couple of instrument instruments and I may be pressing a little bit to see for um for any masses or I'm going to be moving the leg a little bit to see if if there's any pain in the joint or I'm going to check the function of 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 the knee if it's if it's functioning okay if it's moving okay something simple these are the instruments I'm going to use you don't have time to uh, to say this is the webas fork I'm going to use this I'm going to use this other one. I'm going to use this stethoscope to listen to your lungs. You will not have time and you will not finish. So P, E, C, this consent, is this okay with you? And then the next C, I will have a, uh, I, uh, I'd like to have a chaperone also. Um, and then you, if you uh, experience any discomfort, if it is uncomfortable for you in any way, please let me know okay all right then after the the physical exam then you tell them thank you very much 
for uh, even uh, or even before you before you start your physical exam, you say thank you for uh, really exposing the area properly. Uh, thank you for the proper exposure, and also um, if you are doing um, uh, let's say if there has been improper exposure, so in a in in an, an examination where the abdomen needs to be examined. If you are seeing part of the breast being exposed, but please, by all means say, you know what, I need you to cover up a little bit more. Or if it shows, if they're, 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 you're doing an abdominal exam and they're, they're showing right a little bit uh, below the waist, that's not, you don't need the, the area below the waist, just cover them up. You will gain points like this. Some um, situations have been presented to um, uh, you know doctors where the whole abdomen plus the breasts are exposed, and very few people said, "You know what? I don't need to uh, examine uh, the chest area so we can cover the breast. All I need is to examine your stomach. All I need is to feel the positioning of the baby. I do not need to examine." The, the chest area. So you're being tested, but you do not know. Okay, so if there is overexposure, please by all means say, I would like you to cover up the area that we do not need um, to examine. The room is cold anywhere, anyway, and I do not want you to, um, to feel cold. All right, after you're done with the examination, ask them in the first question after an exam, how was that? Was there any pain? Was there any discomfort? No, doctor. Thank you again for exposing the area well. From the examination, don't even, from the examination and from what you've told me, I think that this might be happening. Give the diagnosis. The way I do it is from the questions that you answered and from the uh, examination that you've given me, there are a couple of things that might be going on. I may need to do a, a, a few more tests. I would like to check your thyroid function tests or your kidney tests or your liver tests so that um, if there are any results that need to be given to you, then you'll give uh, time for those results to come in before you give a diagnosis. So there are different ways you can relay a diagnosis to a patient. You can say, okay, there are a couple of things that are going on. I need to investigate more in order to know what is going on. Or there are a couple of things that may be going on according to your symptoms. You may have an infection or it could have been caused by this medication that you're taking. There, there is more chance that your, 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 um, your symptoms have been caused by this medication. Oh, really, doctor, my, my, um, uh, my, my, it, my leg swelling may be caused by infection or as a side effect of a medication. Yes, or even your heart. So we need to do a couple of more tests. We need to do a couple of more tests, yes? Um, then you give your diagnosis. All right, instead of saying that you have an epidural hematoma, Say a CT scan is given and it is an epidural hematoma. They say, you know, you have uh, the CT scan shows that you have a collection of blood in the head. You break it down. That way you don't say um, you have an epidural hematoma. Do you know what this is? You're wasting time with, with all these extra, extra words. Just say, you, uh, you, it, you're, by, by your, um, the results of your CT scan, or by the results of the imaging, it shows that you have uh, a bleed in the brain. This is known as epidural hematoma. Your thyroid levels are higher than normal. This is a condition known as hyperthyroidism. Or your thyroid is overworking. This is a condition known as hyperthyroidism. What we will do now is we will, we we, there, there are different ways to manage hyperthyroidism and I'll have my consultant go through the plan of care when we are finished or I'll have my seniors come in and take a look at the plan of care when we are finished. But we will start you on 
some antithyroid medications. Some of the medications are carbimazole. Yeah, management. Um, or if they need to be admitted, you say, um, we will be keeping you in the hospital now. We need to stabilize you, start you on antibiotics, and even run further um, tests. We need to send uh, more blood work for a troponin level. And we'll also have uh, um, our colleagues in cardiology to come and take a look at you. And they may advise for more tests. Okay. Would you like to call somebody to let them know that you're in the hospital? Would you like to call a family member to come and be with you while you're in the hospital? Okay. Um, if they are going home, this is when you give your safety netting. We are going to start you on these antibiotics for your uh, for your your chest for your walking pneumonia. Uh, please make sure that you complete the full dose, even if you feel the symptoms have improved. Um, there is also some pain medication that I'd like you to have. But if you have any shortness of breath, uh, if you have any chest pain, please call 999 or please uh, uh, come back to the hospital. This is the template that I have in every single case, in practice and in examinations. You start with the chief complaint. You tell them to tell me more. You console them. You do your history of presenting illness, your Socrates, your Odipara, or my old card. You show compassion again. You ask if they have any questions. You do a review of systems. You console them again, ask questions, and then you go into your past medical history, which starts with any hospitalizations. Uh, and then you go right through your maftosa, your, med your medications, allergies, lifestyle. Remember, if you have not asked about what they do for a living, you can ask it after, after, after smoking. And then you have S-A-L-T plus travel. And then you go, so I've done, I've done this over and over and over. It's second nature. So I'm a, ro I'm a robot in that nature, but it's only known to me. And it's a system that can be applied by everyone because you will put your own individual touch to it, but you will not miss any diagnosis. You will not miss any symptom. And you will also build a better rapport with the patient. After you ask your sort, smoking, alcohol, uh, what do you do for a living? Do you travel for work? Then I, I, I stop. Is it a pregnant lady? Is it a pediatric? Is it an old patient? Is it a young person? Is, are they middle age? And then after this, I ask for my vital signs in full, my heart rate, blood pressure, or two sats temperature, and a blood glucose. Remember, this will save you if it's an emergency or for hypoglycemia. We are going to do a physical exam of your knee. I'm going to take a look at, uh, at your hand. Uh, PE, I need to use these instruments. The procedure involves the use of this, um, uh, of, of, of this uh, scope that I'm going to look into your eye. Um, exposure, um, consent, chaperone if needed. And if you feel uncomfortable during the system, uh, during uh, the examination, please let me know. And then after that, I explain it and I explain the diagnosis in a full manner so that I don't, the patient doesn't have to ask what is uh, atrial fibrillation or what is bronchiolitis. I say you have an in, in inflammation of um, some of, of, of your, uh, some areas of your lungs. Uh, and this is known as bronchiolitis, you save time. You can always ask them before uh, you do your uh, physical exam, you can always ask them, is there anything that I left out that may be important for you to tell me? Some people have been saved by this question if they've forgotten to ask about smoking. Um, and then after you uh, after you ask uh, or after you ask you after you've done your physical exam, you also always go to bring things together. It's always good to bring. Them. So thank you for answering those questions, uh, and also for the for the physical exam. Your lab work has returned, and it is all pointing to a diagnosis of hypertension, hyperthyroidism. This is this is 
uh, let my uh, seniors know or I'll let my, the consultant know, we will keep you in or we'll let you go home or we'll start you on this medication or we'll start this IV fluids. Do you want to call somebody uh, to let them know that you're here if you're going to keep them? And then if they are going home, you have to do safety. Another thing with, um, if you're practicing for an examination, you have to practice with time. When I was practicing with my examination, I would practice with time and two minutes, I would know how two minutes feels. So I, I know I'm now into one minute and 45 seconds. I have a lot of management I want to give this patient, but I don't have time. I will be penalized if I do not finish the station. So I have to give up my pride of wanting to give all the management and I have to give the slither of management and give safety netting. So you're better off with just a little bit of management and more safety netting. Because if this patient goes home and dies and uh, later on they ask, you know, why, why didn't you come to the hospital? Well, I was never told that uh, shortness of breath or chest pain or all these things would are a symptom that I'm having um, a heart attack or the facial droop. You want to make sure that your patient knows what to do when they go home. This is crucial. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is a little gift I've given during the week. If you have any questions, I will try and do another Zoom session on Friday at 7 p.m., uh, but you can get me on the WhatsApp group. It's uh, Club Strategies. My name is Leanne uh, Washira, and let us help each other become better doctors. Thank you so much, and goodbye.